I'm here with Eric J. Parker, one of the 17 remaining defendants in the case that involves the Bundy Ranch protest, which culminated in a tense but brief standoff on April 12, 2014. Eric and the rest of the remaining defendants were recently present for a hearing before Magistrate Judge Peggy A. Lean, where oral arguments were heard for a wide range of motions. Eric, tell us how the hearing went in general and what motions were argued before the judge. I feel that it went pretty good. Uh, it's hard to say exactly what's going to be the outcome. You can never really tell if the judge is just giving lip service to the cameras and the media in the room or if she's really showing you love and understanding these motions. So it's kind of hard to say. What we covered was motion to dismiss due to destruction of evidence, uh, motion to dismiss the charges due to lack of jurisdiction and the motion to dismiss the 924C charges. Those are the most important things that we covered. So you said that the issue of the 924C charges were argued before the judge. And for those that don't know, a 924C charge is an enhancement to another charge that carries substantial, stiff, mandatory minimum sentences that must be served consecutively or one after the other. A 924C is commonly known as use or carry of a firearm in a crime of violence. The multiple 924C charges do two things in this case. One, they inflate potential prison terms to effective life sentences. And two, the mandatory minimums are one of the factors per the Bail Reform Act of 1984 that give rise to a preponderance of evidence that no combination of circumstances exists that will ensure a defendant will report for trial. In short, the penalties attached to multiple 924C charges make pretrial release almost impossible. Eric, tell us about some of the arguments to get these 924C charges dropped. Well, uh, let's see. The, the motion to dismiss the 924Cs is kind of a hard one to explain. The Supreme Court has recently defined what a crime of, redefined what a crime of violence consists of. So a lot of 924C enhancements haven't been holding up, and that's the basis for our motion to dismiss. The motion was argued by the public defenders, who did a really good job, as far as I could tell. Uh, it all seems to have come down to the definition was found to be constitutionally vague, or what they call constitutionally vague. The decision is commonly referred to as the Johnson case. And basically the court found if you can perpetrate the alleged crime without physically hurting someone, then it's not a crime of violence. In that, you can't add the enhancement of use or carry of a gun in a crime of violence to said alleged crime. In our case, they attached four enhancements, making the mandatory minimum over 80 years if we were found guilty. The prosecution attached them to the charges of conspiracy, which is basically talking or planning a crime, threatening, which is a communication, extortion, which is a threat, which is still a communication. The only one that's not a no-brainer is assault, but the way the law is written, you can assault, you know, quote, assault a federal officer without physically hurting him, which should render the enhancement invalid. When the prosecution started their oral arguments, they, stay, they started talking in such circles that they lost me in a legal terminology. They quoted laws and court rulings. Eventually, I leaned over to my lawyer and asked if they were doing it on purpose. About that time, the prosecutor was reading out of a legal book. He lost his place and got tongue-tied and seemed to confuse himself. My lawyer looked at me and we decided they were trying the old baffle with bullshit. About that time, the judge asked the prosecutors if they expected the court to ignore the writing on the wall. My, my lawyer leaned over and said, you know, I like that, uh, that's good for us. The public defender stood up for his rebuttal and he said uh, one line, the definition for a crime of violence is still the same in all those cases. We're hopeful that they get dropped, well, that they all get dropped. We're confident on three out of four. But like I said, it's hard to say what she's going to do. 
You also mentioned that there was a motion to dismiss, and we know that Cliven Bundy has a motion to dismiss the entire case based on issues related to jurisdiction. Uh, his attorney has filed several motions that present a very interesting opinion on the matter. Can you explain where Cliven Bundy is coming from and how it was argued during the hearing? Yeah, so I guess uh, we'll start um, in the indictment. The prosecution claims, and I quote, the Bunkerville allotment is an area near Bunkerville, Nevada, under the management of the BLM. The United States has owned this land comprising the allotment since 1848, when it was acquired from the nation of Mexico under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and has never relinquished ownership. This is one of the most interesting issues at hand because this is the first time in history it will be litigated in federal court. The fact of the matter is the assertion by the prosecution is false. The Treaty of Guadalupe did assign a very large section of land to the U.S. government, but that's where the truth in their assertion ends. Now, I don't have a total understanding of this, and so I'm probably not the best person to explain, but here's what I do know. That land, after the transfer in 1848, was broken into territories. In 1864, Lincoln made Nevada a state. In 1866, the Arizona Territory gives what is now Clark County directly to the state of Nevada. The Bunkerville allotment being in that gift becomes part of the sovereign state of Nevada. This action was ratified by the 39th Congress, Session 1, Chapter 73, sorry, in 1866, meaning this land was relinquished to the state. It is not owned by the United States. The only way they can claim jurisdiction over the land and its use is through contract, which Cliven has none. He has not had a contract with the BLM since 1993. What does all this mean? Well, if there is no contract, then there is no grazing fee. If there is no grazing fee, then there is no grazing fee debt. If there is no grazing fee debt, then there is no ability for a lawful court order, which means there shouldn't have been a roundup, an assault on Dave Bundy, Margaret Houston, or Ammon Bundy, or a free speech zone, which means there wouldn't have been a protest or rogue agents pointing guns at protesters. So after the defense lawyers made all these points, it was the prosecution's turn to re rebuke. Only since this has never been litigated, there was no case precedent for them to fall back on. And since all the points about land and jurisdiction are cut and dry, proven with historical documentation, there was no debating these. The prosecution's answer to the motion was, but your honor, they used violence. At which point, the judge, God bless her, told them that they can no longer use such inflammatory language without proof of real violence. So what the outcome will be, I'm not sure, but uh, it was very interesting. Finally, uh, there was a motion to dismiss based on the destruction of evidence. Um, tell us about the substance of this motion and how it was argued in the hearing. So after the BLM pulled out of the impound area, the local trash collecting company picked up uh, the dumpsters. In, in the dumpsters, they found numerous garbage bags full of shredded papers and a few that didn't make it to the shredder. Being the small town that it is, the garbage man contacted the Bundys and asked if they wanted the bags. What they found was lots of destroyed documents and notes. In the oral arguments, the prosecution claims all the papers were duplicate documents that we can subpoena or contact info for the contract cowboys rounding up the cattle. They claimed they were afraid the protesters would get them when they, quote, overran the impoundment area, uh, which was their incident command post, as they refer to it. There's a few things wrong with this story. First, there was no attempt to overrun the impound area. The sheriff told everyone the BLM was leaving earlier that day at the stage. Ammon told the agent in charge while he was in the wash that the protesters were staying in the wash and that they weren't going into the impound area without the sheriff. So the idea that uh, mass shredding was because they were scared, we would come take uh, 
of these papers is pretty asinine. Uh, they could have loaded the papers into trucks with everything else. Second, from what we can tell, a lot of the papers were handwritten notes, uh, not duplicate documents. The notes that weren't destroyed show lists of strike teams, sniper positions, designations, and uh, team schedules. And most interesting was the intelligence gathering that was going on. Um, these are all things the BLM claim were not happening. Uh, the, the prosecution actually specifically said there was no intelligence in these notes. And uh, we, we can show that that's just not true. Uh, we are trying to get an evidentiary hearing to show our proof. We're asking for all the charges to be dropped. Well, those are some interesting arguments from the Bundys there. Motion to dismiss based on jurisdiction, destruction of evidence and obviously the Supreme Court's interpretation of the USA versus Johnson. So is there anything else that you'd like to share with people as a departing remark here? We're obviously going to watch and see uh, how some of these motions come out, and we're going to see how the judge rules, and we're going to try to get a hold of some audio from that court hearing and see if we can just compare uh, the sentiment that she expressed there and, and how things come out through her rulings. So are there is there anything else that you'd like to share um, yeah, uh, we also covered severance, which is uh, the the way we're going to be tried and, and who's going to be tried in what groups. We argued that uh, we all wanted to go together, which was, uh, you know, the general consensus was everybody wanted to go together. It was kind of strange because the prosecution pretty much did a 180 turnaround from nine months ago because we all filed severances the government opposed every one of them the prosecution opposed every one of them I have an eight page uh, opposition to my severance request which was for um, the Scott, Steve and myself to go because we were together the whole time we drove down there together they're the only ones I knew prior to going to the ranch you know I, I had no connection with anybody else there so that was my severance I have an eight page opposition to that severance and, and now the government came and said hey we want to break this into three smaller bites the, the interesting thing to note was as soon as that was brought up the judge actually said it's no secret that the government thought they were going to have a different outcome in Oregon and are, are now trying to, you know, break this thing into three smaller manageable bites. So at the time, we kind of thought that we were going to at least have two two hearings instead, but um, she, she did rule on that already, and, and she is breaking it into three. The only difference is they're putting uh, what the government wanted as the third tier, which is the, the quote, followers, gunmen, that they call us, to go first. In court, the prosecution basically admitted that that third tier was because they were the least inculpatory, which means that they had the least evidence for that third tier, which makes sense because there was no, there was no conspiracy. <laughs> but anyways, the idea that they have the least inculpatory evidence for us is, is pretty telling and we're going to apparently go to court February 6th so I just would like to say we're ready and I hope to see everybody there get out there and, and, and wave your flags and, and let them know you, you disagree with what's going on February 6th is just about 8 weeks away so that time's going to go fast and I think if, if anyone else could be here, they would let you know that you have a lot of supporters, all of you guys, and I think you'll have a decent turnout there to support you. And, of course, we're, we're all in your corner and we've all got your back. So keep your head in the case and stay strong, and thank you for the time today. Yeah, thank you.